as a meter, we should start, uh, although we will start slowly while your colleagues still are arriving, uh, we, we have to, to start, right? Today is our last day, and uh, we have a lot to do today, and we also have uh, to, to, to sort of review what we've already seen here so that we end up with the big picture at the end of this uh, course, right? Remember from the first day, I'm telling you about ants knowing the details of a, uh, of a leaf, uh, monkeys knowing the tree very well, and the eagle having a broad view of the, of the whole forest. Uh, I expect that, of course, in a week time from now, or a month time from now, you will have, come, come in, come in, uh, you will have the, you still have very detailed ideas about this course, you will still be able to remember, uh, you know, a, a lot that we've said, uh, as a, let's say, a, an ant, or a monkey know the leaf or the or the tree, but I hope that in morning, uh, Serge, uh, I hope that in, in in a year from now, two years from now, ten years from now, you still have the view of the eagle, right? You can still. It's not that you're going to remember what we discussed in this 20-hour course, but you will uh, you will remember it because hopefully you will have used these ideas uh, uh, to make sense of the work that you're doing, either in internship or your first uh, real job. Uh, and that will also push you to, to, to your second job, or at least to, to a second position in the same firm. And hopefully, uh, there will be, uh, even if it's a humble contribution, there will still be a, a contribution of the things that we discussed here. So it's important for us to uh, know the details for now. Uh, and this is why I really uh, recommend that you read uh, the papers uh, over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, I will be there, I will not, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll have our, our WhatsApp group that will be, from my end, will be open forever. So if you have any doubts, uh, feel free to contact me that way. You also have my, my email. Let me share that with you here on, on the screen as well. You have my email, you can contact me at any time. Um, but, uh, don't uh, don't waste this uh, window of opportunity that is reading those papers while you still have my words in your minds. Right? I mean, if you read it uh, a year from now, it will probably not be that meaningful. It will also only seem to be an old paper that some professor brought to you. Uh, again, uh, as I've told you before, I have to read all the new stuff. In fact, I have to read the stuff even before it's published because I am a part of the editorial board of several of our information systems journals. Uh, 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 and um, so, so I, I, I have contact with what is new very soon, but I tend to think that the ideas that last uh, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, are ideas that are there to last another 20 or 30 years at least. And even when we don't think that they last any longer, they were the grounds they were the ground on which other ideas were built afterwards. So it's important that we, we understand that. Uh, again, before we go any further, I want to just remember what we saw uh, on our previous uh, meetings. We discussed the value of uh, IT. Uh, in, I told you that in the 90s, there was all this discussion about a productivity paradox, uh, meaning that all money that was spent on technology, on, on information technology in organizations was uh, hardly seen uh, in their results, and, and when I mean their results, in their, uh, in their economic results. Uh, many people were, were claiming that money that was invested or spent on, on IT was really thrown in the garbage. Uh, of course, we all know that uh, the companies that succeeded uh, over that period of time and, 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 and are still large organizations, they're companies that believed on the importance of uh, using information technology, um, but they were probably the ones that were doing the right thing and, and, and not doing things right. Remember, I keep insisting on that. Uh, if, you, if you get a new technology and the only thing that you can see about uh, that technology is the possibility of doing what you already do in a more efficient way, you're probably losing uh, an important opportunity of doing something different. New technologies allow us to do different things. And probably those different things are the ones that will matter. So maybe the, the problem that these guys were having back then in the 90s and even in the early 2000s when we had, for example, uh, Nicholas Carr 
here, where is my cursor? When, when we had Nicholas Carr uh, uh, claiming that IT didn't matter, right? Uh, what was happening was that the companies that they were analyzing or the use of technology that they, they were uh, analyzing was mainly this use of technology for efficiency, for doing faster or with better quality things that we were already used to do. And the problem when you do something faster, but that's not what we should be doing any longer, is that we go faster to a place where we should never try to be. Okay? Uh, so uh, I think that, that this is uh, overcome already. Uh, we, we do not have to, to waste any more time on the productivity paradox because uh, it's definitely over. But we, we spent also some time discussing the ways uh, uh, some of our authors of the 90s uh, claimed that we could, could use uh, technology then to transform organizations. They, 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 they talked about business transformation. Uh, it's a pity that they didn't use the, the, the expression digital transformation back then. Because if they did, well, we know what would happen if they did use digital transformation in the 90s as the expression to, to talk about, about this. Probably whoever is talking about digital transformation today would find another buzzword. They would say that they are doing something different. My claim here is that we're not doing anything different. Whatever those companies were doing, doing during the pandemic and claiming it was digital transformation, you know, and, and, and as if it was something completely new, I said this has been around for at least 20 years. Right? When authors like uh, uh, Makina, for example, were talking about building the dialogue with the customers, that's precisely what digital transformation is, is promoting now. Okay? Get closer to your customers. Make sure that you reach those customers in ways that it was impossible to reach without the technologies we have today. Uh, so, uh, uh, again, we spent uh, some time on Wednesday talking about the IT enabled business transformation. Venka Chairman could have uh, written a paper, IT uh, and enabled digital transformation. It's the same thing, business transformation. Uh, when business transformation that is caused by or that is provoked by uh, the introduction of new technology, new digital technology, is digital transformation. Okay, uh, so we, we we did spend some time talking about that on on Wednesday. Uh, we of course spent uh, um, sorry sorry we, we did that even on, on Monday I believe, and then uh, on Wednesday uh, in the morning we discussed how we could use technology to transform organizations in terms of the way they relate to, to their to their customers. Uh, and basically, I would, if I had to summarize uh, McKenna's ideas, I would say, well, all, all of what he said in that paper was use technology to understand your customer better, building a dialogue with that customer. And the dialogue is not a dialogue on the phone, because if you're talking on the phone with your customers or face to face, you need one representative of your company to talk to one of the customers. Right? If you have a million customers, that means that you will probably have to have a million uh, employees. So that's not feasible, that's not practical. Uh, his ideas uh, involved already using the company's systems to make sure that the, the customer had that perception that he or she was being treated in a very personalized way. But that was being done by a machine at the other end, by, by the system. And I'm not talking here about the systems that emulates uh, a person at the other side trying to be talking to you in a chat, right? I mean, that could also ha happen if we could do that uh, effectively, right? If, if people uh, had their problem solved, preferably if they didn't even notice that it was uh, a robot uh, dealing with them, right? But, uh, and of course, when I'm talking about a robot here, I mean just uh, technology at the other end. But that's not the case, at least not for now. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, this is not what we're talking about. We're talking many times about the customer dealing with the company's systems, including information there that helps the company provide them with, the customers provide them with better value, with more value. And, uh, and customers will do that only if they perceive that the time that they're spending providing companies with, their, with, their, with, with information about them is really uh, uh, reflecting on better products or better services. Uh, in fact, uh, there is all the discussion about uh, privacy, uh, privacy and, 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 and privacy invasion by companies when they start demanding a lot of information from us. And this is an ethical concern. We should, we should all be, our society should be um, 
careful about the way it uh, deals with uh, so much sharing of information about about us, about individuals. But at the same time, uh, uh, what we notice is that most people will not complain when they feel that that privacy invasion uh, is made in a way that it provides customers or provide themselves with convenience, with uh, a, a, a better level of service or whatever. Okay, so when we usually think of the way you relate to the fact that companies are collecting data from you, you get annoyed when you see data being collected and you don't even know how it's going to be used uh, or who will use it. That, 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 that's really disturbing. But when you get information collected from you that you directly perceive as providing you with uh, more value, you're happy about it. And you, you spend, sometimes spend uh, hours of your life contributing to that. For example, someone who's helping, uh, well, it's not helping design uh, the tennis shoes uh, on a Nike uh, virtual environment, as Nabisan and Nabisan called it. It's more, it's not designing, right? Because the shoes are already designed. It's, it's more like customizing. Assembly. assembly, yeah. Helping, helping in the assembly of your, of your product already. But customers may spend hours thinking of the details of the tennis shoes they want before they click and send their, their credit card information to be charged. Those hours they spent uh, are, are, are not felt as wasted time because they were getting, they, they were doing that to get a product that was precisely what they wanted. At the same time, uh, from the company's perspective, those hours that the, that person spent are very rich in the sense that they help the company understand better not only that specific customer for a future uh, um, interaction, but also other customers that the company can statistically match as being somewhat similar to, to the customer that they just uh, that they just uh, provided service to. Uh, so. Companies are happy in, the, in, in cases like that even to sell their products at a lower price than cost because they know that this is adding value to their next sales to that customer specifically and uh, more often to other customers that are not buying the customized products. Remember I told you that there is this important um, relationship between cost price and value, cost has to be lower than price because cost is the amount of money a company will spend to pack value in a, in a product or service. Uh, and then when the, the, the company sells this product to a customer, it needs to have its profit. So the price has to be higher than the, the, the cost. But then uh, for the customer to be interested in buying that product, the value has to be higher than price. So these things have to happen. and and. And, the, and, and but sometimes a company may uh, wish to sell a product uh, for a price that is lower to the, the cost of producing that specific unit because they know okay I'll, I'll have a loss here but I will recover this in uh, the future because of the knowledge in fact the company is buying knowledge so this is why I believe that Nike has not turned all its business into selling shoes online right it's still probably more expensive or less advantageous uh, to them to, to, to sell directly to, to the end customer, this specific product, tennis shoes. But they know that if they sell directly to a few customers, that will provide them with knowledge that will make their value proposition much better for other customers and that's worth. Okay? Uh, we always have to think, if someone starts a business and, and does something different to what they were doing uh, before, and then they don't, don't push it all the way, they don't, they don't turn their business uh, completely into that, sometimes you may think, well, this, is, this seems to have been a failure then because they attempted something and it seems that it didn't work. Well, if it was not working for Nike, they wouldn't be doing this for over uh, 15 years now. Okay? They're doing that because uh, they believe that that's, uh, that, that's good for, for, for their business uh, and they're not doing it to, to the whole business because probably that would not be good for their business. A company has to understand to what extent they have to do each of their of their actions. Right? So this was uh, uh, Magreta. Uh, we still talked uh, on Wednesday morning about Nambisan and Nambisan's paper. That was that one that went along the value, the several value-adding uh, activities that are performed by an organization and checked in which ways customers could uh, be involved and could help 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, building the, 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 the product. I told you about that. They, they talked about helping conceptualize the product, helping design the product, helping test the product, helping market the product. I think there was another, I missed one of them still. Uh, they didn't talk about the customer producing the product. I told you that that's also a possibility, right? So we, we could go even one, one step further than what uh, Nambisan and Nambisan envisioned in their paper. We can have even the customers producing uh, the product in many cases. We just have to understand in, each, in which situations that is feasible uh, and in which situations that is going to be the right thing to do. And remember, the people in an organization that are capable of uh, better understanding what is the right thing to do are those that have the ego perspective. Right? Hopefully, right? We always hope that those, are, because those are the ones that are defining the strategies for the organization. So we hope that our uh, higher management has the ego's view of the forest. They see more than, than everyone else, and that's why they, they are able to take um, uh, decisions and, and, and push the organization towards a direction that maybe uh, the other, the other um, uh, employees would originally not so easily envision. Uh, but even uh, if the egos have a, a, the, the, the largest, larger scope, a, a better perspective, they still have to communicate that to the people, right? Uh, if the ants and the monkeys uh, in the organization, I mean, everyone else who's in the, the hierarchical pyramid, uh, the ones that are actually doing the work, if they don't understand what they're doing, it, it's probably going to fail. And this is probably the reason why I believe that uh, Michael Dell gave this very detailed interview to Harvard Business Review in 1998 that you read for today's class, uh, in which he's t telling, well, telling Harvard Business Review and therefore the world precisely what his ego's view is, what, what he and, 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 and the other planners of that business, uh, what they think that is the right thing to do. They tell Harvard Business Review because they want their customers to understand their perspective. They want their customers to understand the eagle's uh, objectives, and therefore, and, and, and they, they hope that the, their customers are going to say, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that makes sense to me. I prefer to buy from this company than from one of the competitors because what they're doing seems to be better aligned to my own uh, interests. So notice, when uh, Michael Dell is talking to Harvard Business Review, he's actually trying to talk to each one of its customers or its potential customers. He's also trying to talk to the, to, to the competition. Yeah, uh, many times we think that uh, a strategy is something that has to be hidden from the competition. But of course, if, if we have to tell our, our customers so that they understand what we are proposing, uh, if we have to tell our own employees, because if they don't understand what they're doing, they're not going to be passionate about it, they're not going to put all their effort into it because simply they, they don't understand it, they, they don't value it. Right? So, if he's, he already has to convince so many people, uh, why not include also the competition? So I think that there's a lot that Michael Dell says in, in between lines in his interview that is a message to the competition. Basically what he says, you cannot mimic what I'm doing here, you cannot copy what I'm doing here, because uh, to do that you, have, you have to tear your companies apart and start from scratch. He said, I started my company to be like that. You started your company to do a different business. Tough luck, right? You've already started in a different way. You build uh, strong brick walls that are very difficult to put down now. And even if you put them down, that means that you will be able to compete with me in this new market that, that I am generating here. But you, you lose all the market that you had before. Are you, you know, are you daring taking that risk? This is why, uh, in my understanding, IBM, Compaq, and HP all were looking at Dell's success like uh, you know those uh, guys who, who enchant uh, uh, snakes and then then the then, then the, they're not like that and they don't they don't move. It seems that that's the, 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 it's it's what happened uh, so, uh, to 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 Dell's competitors. They were looking at what uh, Dell was doing and they couldn't do anything. Right? So, let's think of the paper that you read about the, well, this Dell's interview as not as a, something that simply happened, well, uh, the, the Harvard Business Review had 
to interview someone, they decided, why not Michael Dell this time? Of course, they interviewed Michael Dell because Dell was at the center of attention at that uh, moment. Dell had just become the leader in computer and, and PCs, uh, personal computer selling in the world. Uh, uh, I think the Christmas of 1998 was the first time that a company was selling more than $10 million a day prior to Christmas through the internet. Remember, in 98 we didn't even have Google yet, so the, the internet was the far west uh, of, uh, of business. Uh, but people saw, people thought, well, it seems that that's where things, it's, it seems to be the place where action will happen in the future. So everyone was, wanted to, to understand what Michael Dell, uh, what, what Dell was doing. But it wasn't uh, uh, some casual interview. I, I believe that this was very well planned because Dell had this idea of making its business understood by the market. And uh, he also wanted to make it clear that no one, at, at least at that stage, no one in the market could compete with his company simply because he was doing the right thing while the others were doing right the wrong thing, the old way of uh, selling computers. Okay, uh, well, before we get to, to, to discuss then uh, uh, this uh, uh, Michael Dell's interview uh, and still summarizing what we did before, on Wednesday afternoon, we did our, our beer game. Uh, and I believe that the beer game uh, is a good introduction to this interview. Right? Because what happened here when you played the beer game, uh, uh, let's say a simulation of a supply chain or a value chain in which each one of you were selling products to another company in the same uh, supply chain uh, and trying to optimize locally, trying to reduce your costs, we ended up seeing that when, we, when, when everyone was doing that, we ended up including uh, or, or increasing the price, uh, or sorry, increasing the costs for the overall supply chain, which which end up being uh, something that will end up being paid either by the customer when the customer has no other alternatives, or which will lead the company to fail because um, there is no, you know, the customers will choose the competition. Uh, if sh sh sure, <laughs> sure, 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 yeah, it's it's better to yeah rest uh, from home, and you can always uh, watch the video uh, later. Just take it, take it easy. <laughs> um, so uh, the uh, I think that I, I hope that when you were while you were reading um, Michael Dell's interview, you were thinking about ways in which Dell avoided the problems of the bullwhip effect or for example or the it's also called the Forrester effect because Forrester was the professor who thought of the beer game in the 1950s uh, in the MIT. Uh, Dell does not have this problem. Uh, in fact that, that was one of the, the questions that I posed uh, uh, in the in our Moodle forum. If we had any evidence of the bullwhip effect happening in the computer, the PCs market, uh, well, if it happened, it did not happen for Dell because Dell was selling computers through the internet. It was a, a made, make to order approach. Uh, and when you, when you work with a make to order approach, there is no inventory, or at least no, no inventory of final products because uh, whatever product you finish has already a customer to which it is, uh, let's say, attached. Okay, uh, but uh, I'm curious to, to, to know if you found in your reading any evidence that IBM or Compaq or Dell were facing uh, the, the Forrester effect uh, problem in their supply chains. Uh, I think that that's, that's one of those things that appear there in the, in the details. So what we have for today, uh, uh, okay, so this, this, what we have for today is the, this paper, uh, The Power of Virtual Integration, this interview with Michael Dell. And I think we'll change our approach a little bit today. Instead of me uh, lecturing you about, I included here some forum questions that we could uh, try and discuss. And uh, my idea would be that we, we spent, uh, so let me see what happened here. Uh, yep, I just have to click here, I believe. 
my idea is that you get to to our uh, forum in our Moodle platform and uh, maybe we spend some half an hour to one hour trying to go through some of these questions that I included here and seeing in which ways you can respond to them based on the text. For those who had uh, who, who read it in, in, in detail, uh, it will be easier. For those who haven't read it yet, it's a, a way of uh, um, making sure that you, you do a first reading of the paper. So let's spend some, let's see, four, some 40 minutes trying to deal with some of these uh, questions here. Maybe if you have already decided that you want to address one of them, you just tell your colleagues, oh, I'll be working on that question so that others may choose a different uh, question to work on. And then after that, we will, we will discuss. Right? Oh, you have to choose one. Well, you choose one, you work on that. I think I included here some uh, 14, I don't remember, 14, 15 questions. Uh, how many there? I included uh, 16 questions, right? So. Uh, Probably which one of us will do some uh, three or four of them. Uh, it, it depends on how, how, how quick we go. Uh, I would like to spend some 40 minutes on that, and then we will discuss if the question that you were, if, if you were able to address one question, you can get to, 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 to a second one. Otherwise, uh, at the end, uh, I also think that these questions can help me, uh, to some extent, lecture you on that, uh, make, make sure that I don't forget any important aspect of the paper. As I said, I've read this paper probably over 50 times over my uh, or since 1998, and uh, and I've already told you that each time I, I read it, at least for the first 20 times, there was some small detail that I thought, well, I had not thought of that, but it seems that they have something here that is also important. There may be even things there that not even Michael Dell knew about, right? For example, I am sure that, well, I'm not sure, but I, I think that it's very probable that Michael Dell has never been to a beer game simulation, right? Yeah. He could have, uh, well, he did not study at the MIT, he studied in, in, in Texas. Uh, well, he, I think he only studied the first year of, uh, and, and he was studying medicine, right? Uh, when he decided to, to get on an entrepreneur uh, journey and left uh, university. So yeah, he definitely had never seen something like the beer game, but he got, he's got the solution for the problem of uh, the boom effect, selling directly to, to, to the end customer, right? So some of that may, may have been out of luck. Some of them may have been uh, out of uh, vision. Uh, uh, maybe some of that has been because he was trying to solve one problem, and by solving that problem, other problems are also solved. So there's a lot that may have happened. And, uh, and I'm sure that not even him or his uh, team knew everything about it. They were attempting, and things were happening, were, were doing right. But we have the knowledge to understand why some of his uh, his company's attempts were successful, at least uh, now, some 20, 20 something years later. Okay. All right. So I'll stop recording here, and uh, we'll restart recording when we we are to discuss the these questions. All right, uh, great guys. Uh, the idea of uh, having you write uh, some answers to those questions to start with was just to warm up. All right. My uh, my intention with uh, this questions in the forum is use them almost if, if, for example, if I had a PowerPoint here, each of these questions would be a bullet that will, that will be something that I wanted to address. As I told you uh, yesterday, I think that this, uh, sorry, uh, Wednesday, uh, this paper is very, it has a lot of information uh, in it and, uh, well, I hope, I, I keep justifying why I choose these old papers, right? But uh, although this is not the way Dell works any longer, I hope while we were reading, you were able to think how clever this uh, approach is to many other, even to many other uh, businesses that can turn their production lines into a more modularized way of uh, building products, that can outsource parts of what they do to exter external suppliers, and by doing that, uh, uh, can share with these external suppliers the responsibility uh, for the whole product in a way that each one does what one knows best, right? It will appear here. I think this is one of the questions that Mariam was working on. Uh, it will appear here, the situation in which Michael Dell said, I don't want to be the 21st horse in a, a horse race. I prefer to be a, an spectator, see the best horse and then align with that be uh, best horse in the sense that I prefer to uh, choose the best partners instead of trying to do everything inter internally in the organization. There's a lot here to be discussed about the, 
the benefits or the problems of being uh, vertically uh, oriented as an organization or horizontally oriented. Vertically oriented mean, meaning doing everything uh, inside the organization. And uh, horizontally oriented being a company that does part of the work but shares other parts with, with partners that are better at doing that or, or that, that are uh, more efficient at doing that or whatever. Okay? Uh, so uh, let, let's just go quickly through uh, all the questions that I, that I pose here. Um, what is uh, Dell's direct model and uh, what are uh, its main advantages? Uh, many people think of this direct model as a direct, direct sale model because I mean it's very clear that Dell sells directly to the end, uh, the, the end customer or the consumer, right? So it definitely is uh, a the direct model is direct when we're looking downstream. But one thing that many people do not see is that Dell's direct model is also direct upstream. Although he claims that he he, he likes to work with the best horses, it will appear in, in another question below. But although he he, he claims that he wants to, to always partner with companies that are the best uh, in their value propositions in whatever they do. Um, he doesn't, uh, you know, he doesn't want to have many layers of suppliers. Right? So he, he deals with uh, very directly with, their, with, with uh, the company's customers, and he also deals with just a few um, providers or a few uh, suppliers. Uh, <coughs> for several reasons, but one of them, I think this is something that Wei was working on, uh, is that he believes that Dell has to be an important customer to its suppliers. Right? When you are import an important customer to your suppliers, it means that if you, if you need your suppliers to be flexible about something, simply because the market needs you to be flexible, you will probably have that, uh, the, you will have that cooperation in the flexibility that you need. For example, if you need them to work extra hours so that they, they deliver uh, more uh, parts to you uh, because th there was a, you know, something that you had not predicted. Remember, Dell doesn't like predicting. Okay, Maria? Uh, so to use Maria's word the other day, whenever we predict something, we are already uh, at a situation that we know that there are risks that we're wrong. Dell prefers to predict the least he can. Uh, and the way of predicting the least is being very flexible to cope with the contingencies of changes in the environment. We can either choose to predict the environment, and when we predict the environment we can say, well, uh, uh, I, I will plan for this specific scenario, and then I, I have to hope that that scenario happens because if something different happens, bad luck, you know, um, all my prediction made me work towards that. <coughs> Dell uh, seems to believe that it's better to be flexible enough to deal with contingencies. Uh, and uh, it's not that he doesn't plan for the future, it's simply that he wants to have more flexible, more agile plans. And, and for that he needs to involve the suppliers also. So. The suppliers are very important to, to him. He doesn't want the suppliers to, when posed with a difficult situation, say, oh, sorry, Dell, that's too much for me. Deal with it your own, uh, on, on your own. Uh, he wants them to say, yes, let's embrace that challenge together and let's make it happen. Okay? We can only do that if our suppliers believe that we are important to them. In which ways can a company make its suppliers feel that they are, uh, that, that, that the company is, uh, that, that the customer is important to them. Maybe not trying to optimize locally. Remember, we, we discussed that in previous classes. If everyone is trying to optimize locally, everyone is trying to have a, a gain on the other's loss. So if you're a company that is focused on optimizing locally, you will try to squeeze your, your suppliers and get the, the, the lowest prices you can, for the best quality you can. That is one possible way of uh, getting value for your customers. But at the same time, notice that when anything happens and you need, let's say, a favor from your supplier, 
the supplier is going to say, sorry, I have no room to accommodate what you're asking me now because my profit margins are too low. You have already squeezed me to, to a point that I can't do much. So Dell doesn't seem to work that way. Right? And let's say uh, Dell doesn't seem to work that way, at least in the way it is presented here. Yeah, yeah, it, it's just the, the overall strategy. Of course, I'm, I, I have had in the past students that worked for Dell or worked for a, a, a supplier, uh, and they said, well, they, they negotiate price a lot also. Okay, uh, let, let's think. This is, this is the concept. This is not necessarily what happens all the time. And besides, when Dell says that it wants to partner with the suppliers, it doesn't mean that uh, it wants uh, two, two um, relaxed suppliers that will not be uh, focused on reducing cost, improving quality all the time. Uh, in fact, he wants the best horses, right, in the, in the track. Um, so, uh, but again, uh, just to, to, to think of the, uh, the direct model, the direct model, uh, in, in this case here, focuses on directly de dealing with the customers and by doing that, reducing the need for prediction because you're selling uh, products to, uh, that are made to order, not made to, to, uh, to stock. Um, and at the same time, dealing with uh, suppliers very that, that are very close, that work together a lot, that try to optimize globally instead of optimizing locally. In other words, Dell builds some trust with its suppliers that they know that Dell also wants them to be successful in business. And it's not that Dell wants to be the only uh, player that is successful. It, it is concerned with its suppliers being uh, uh, successful also, and, and, and they build this uh, trust somehow, okay? Uh, and what does uh, Michael Dell uh, mean by virtual integration? In which ways does it affect the coordination of activities and the focus of the core competences along the expanded value chain involving suppliers and customers. Well, basically, this uh, uh, being integrated is something important, right? Being integrated means that you, when you're, when when the parts of the the body are well integrated, it means that they work better together systemically, uh, as a whole. Uh, this is probably one of the reasons that in the past many companies decided that they wanted to be vertically integrated, that they wanted to build everything inside the company because being vertically integrated helped them being more coordinated among the several players that had to to work together right uh, uh, a company that that does everything inside its boundaries uh, has one only boss who can tell everyone look, look you have to work harder or you have to to do this until tomorrow because the other department the, the other department is, is expecting that so vertical integration provided in the past this possibility of agility, because everything was under control. Virtual integration uh, tries to uh, attempt to do the same involving external partners. So it has that challenge of it has to be whatever you're doing has to be meaningful to, to those external partners as well. But it also has the advantage that you do not have to do you, you do not have to be the best in everything you do. So when did uh, virtual integration be, become possible? In one of our previous uh, classes, I told you that in the 1960s, Volkswagen in, in, in Brazil, just as an example, had the largest bakery in the country because it needed to feed its uh, workers. The company was very vertically integrated. Since the 60s, we saw not only the, the, uh, the car industry, many other industries turn, into, turn from uh, being uh, vertically integrated to being more horizontal in the, the way they, they, they their structures work. Uh, notice that we don't call car manufacturers any longer. They became car assemblers. Right? Why? Because cars were turned, were modularized, and different companies build different parts of the module. So it's almost like if uh, the car, if car manufacturing also follows Dell's direct model to some extent. Okay? Uh, they may even have uh, uh, developed the, their, their, let's say, this, this new way of organizing for, for production prior to Dell. Right? But most, comp most companies in the, the car industry, the, 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 the old manufacturers became assemblers. And in some kind, some, sometimes they became assemblers that build cars 
together with their suppliers in the sometimes in the same industrial park or the same industrial uh, condominium or whatever uh, and it's even difficult to know who works for which company they all seem to be uh, I don't know uh, Volkswagen or Ford or whatever they all seem to be uh, part of the same organization but they're working sort of in a Dell fashion uh, where the uh, most uh, car manufacturers still uh, they, they still have a few parts of the the, the, the the project that they keep for themselves but others they outsource right? uh, car manufacturers usually I think that to, even today most car manufacturers believe that they have to build the, their engines uh, we usually do not see a let's say a, an assembler a car manufacturer but an assembler that uh, that buys another firm's engine, although that all, that already happens in many cases. But in general, it seems that they still they think that what the customers value the most is the engine, maybe the design. So they keep a few of these things for themselves, but other other things they outsource, and they do outsource because we do have. Well, Dell doesn't mention in his interview, at least not very clearly. Uh, but we know that there is what what causes what allows. This, this horizontalization of the supply chain is the fact that now one can coordinate their tasks and activities with external partners the same way it was possible to do in the past internally in the organization. So this is the virtual integration. Virtual integration has the benefits of the traditional vertical integration, so activities are well coordinated, and it has the benefit of um, of being, let's say, uh, uh, spread and, and sharing with, with, with others because uh, you can benefit from what they do better than you do. Right? So think of the virtual integration as something that has been made possible by the ICTs of the late 20th century and early 21st century. It's, uh, it's actually the fact that we have these technologies that allow communication, uh, inf information sharing and communication among organizations uh, that allowed it, uh, this to, to, to happen. Then a third question that we posed there was why were companies that were already playing in the market such as digital equipment or well, digital equipment doesn't exist any longer, right? It was still around in the late 90s but it failed a little after that because, and maybe the, the reason why it failed was exactly because it was, it was a very vertically integrated and was not able to change the way it worked to a more horizontally integrated uh, way. Uh, but why did these companies uh, work that way? Simply because of history. Yeah, that's that's uh, what uh, Lacunli uh, wrote there. They had structure that had been built and, and that made them work that way. Uh, there is even in, in business there is uh, there's a huge line of uh, uh, studies in what, what they call structuralism uh, or the way uh, structures dictate how we will do things and this is very easy to, for us to understand think for example of this classroom it has a structure right it has been set in a specific way notice that it has been set in a way that there is a table for the teacher in the front and your tables there this sort of dictates the way we're going to work, right? Uh, of course, we, we could always be very innovative and change, but change requires additional effort. So if we don't take that additional effort, the tendency is that we will do exactly what the structure, I would dare to say, determines. Structures determine the way we're going to work. Maybe determine is very strong words, uh, but we, we could even say structures suggest the way we work, but it's a very strong suggestion then, right? Because I, I can assure you, well, I can ask, have you ever had uh, a professor who came here to this classroom or to any classroom that you, you were studying and that instead of sitting here, decided to sit uh, where Selesh is in the middle of the room or maybe at the other corner? Probably not, right? Why? Because it's always been like this. So it had always been like that for digital equipment and it had succeeded. So it said, I'll keep doing whatever I've always done. This is a dangerous path, right? Uh, and again, uh, uh, you, you've, 
you've, you've seen me ask you at least twice here if it was okay if we did this class the way we're doing with me sitting here and you there because I want to challenge I usually try to challenge structures uh, but now I had some other different structure than before here I have a camera and a microphone and a setting that sort of requires that if I want to be seen by you in a recording that I'm here I cannot stand and go around so notice it's a different structure that ch again changes the way we work uh, you've probably seen I, I, I've written very little on the board these days I used to write much more why so the structure is again if not determining suggesting in a very strong way the way we, we, we work so one thing that you should be concerned about when you're thinking technology in the organizations you work is thinking in which ways new technologies br break old structures which may be good may be important in which ways they reinforce old structures well depending on the situation that may also be good I don't know it depends on the strategy right and in, in each ways uh, it allows to become more flexible in what you do uh, we live in times where becoming more flexible may be advisable because the more flexible we are the less we have to predict the future we still have to do a lot of prediction but the, being more flexible means that we we can arrange for uh, situations as they happen instead of trying to guess what's going to happen and many times failing in doing that okay. uh, so digital equipment failed because it was stuck to its structure to its culture to its old ways of doing things <coughs> Uh, there's going to be a question later on in this questionnaire that will ask isn't Dell afraid of uh, the fact that maybe his own model being revolutionary at the time that it would become the cause of Dell's failure because it would not be able to change so notice Dell was trying to build here uh, a model that was flexible enough to allow for changes but what not, what we know 20 years from from, from that time, a little more than that, is that it was not flexible enough to deal with the challenges that Dell uh, faced even, I, I don't know, some seven or eight years after uh, the, this interview, right? What happened in the, in the 2000, 2004, 2005, 2006, during that period, uh, Dell lost leadership in, 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 computer, in the computer business again. It, it lost leadership to, at that stage, to HP. HP lost leadership in terms of numbers of computers sold in the world. That happened around 2005 and 2006. Uh, although there are plans, a, a, a system here that would be more modular, that would allow his company to pick the best players, the best horses, it still had its issues because this, the, the, the model that he built would allow to pick the, be the best horses to make uh, desktop PCs. In 2004-2005 there were many things happening. Notebooks were becoming cheaper and more available to people that in the past had uh, only thought of uh, having a desktop. Uh, well, Del there's something that Dell mentions here in, the, in this uh, interview that was very important to his business. He said, I don't want to sell any anybody their first computer. Right. Whoever buys their first computer doesn't know what, they, what, what, what uh, he or she is buying. Uh, and, uh, and that makes it uh, difficult for them to assess the real value of what they're buying. So that poses a problem. When you're buying something that you don't know, chances are that you're going to look for the best price. Because prices are easily comparable even for someone who doesn't know what they're buying, right? If you don't know what you're buying, uh, you compare you're comparing among possible uh, suppliers tends to be driven by price and he said we don't want to be uh, in that competition for we, we don't want to be a commodity we don't want to have the lowest price we want to have the largest value for our customers so his idea was if it's a, a first-time buyer please go buy from IBM Compaq HP at that time right go buy from those guys you will be you have, have a horrible experience not because they are horrible simply because as you don't know what you're buying you will buy the wrong stuff and then that will not meet your expectations you will be frustrated 
but you will learn from them. And then the second computer you come and buy from us because then you can select what you what you need. You will already know how much memory you need, the, the size of the, 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 the monitor screen that you need, the you, you have an idea of what is the best processor uh, for, for, for your needs and so on and so forth. So his idea was don't want to talk to someone who's buying their first computer. Well, what happened in 2005 and 2006 in the world? This is a very difficult question. You will not answer. You will not be able to answer it, I believe. So I will ask you, in 2004, 2006, 2005, 2006, about that time, what happened in the world that would change the computer market, the PCs, personal computer markets? Laptop that, that was something, yeah, I already mentioned it. That wouldn't impact uh, the. F that that could even be a, a, a something to emphasize the the, the uh, computers being sold. You know, like having more internet and everything. Uh, I said this is a difficult quite difficult question to answer if asked that way. Instead of asking what happened in 2004, 2005, and 2006 to mainly to Dell customers, those people that have already bought a computer before and uh, and they were expected that they would buy their next computer. Uh, maybe the question I have to ask is, what happened in, in 2007 and 2008 in the world? Um, like, um, recession. Recession, crisis. Where was that crisis in the developed world? The, the, developed world, the developed world was where people that had already bought one or two or three computers in the past lived, right? So those people that were, that were Dell's customers and that were willing to buy computers <coughs> through a website were all very and severely impacted by some economical crisis. 2007, 2008, those were the years that in the United States they started having problems even paying the mortgage of their homes. Right? Now I'll ask you, that, that I'll make that question easy. If, if in 2007, 2008 people were, were finding it difficult to pay the mortgage of their homes, what do you think that, what, what were the first things that they started cutting costs in 2004, 2005, things that they stopped buying? Computers, uh, right? Com so per uh, may maybe they thought, well, I, have, I already have a computer, I can deal with it for a little longer. Considering that life is becoming a little uh, more difficult, maybe I will s save money now and not buy another computer. So that's what happens in 2004, 5, and 6 that we can now easily see but of course, at that time, Dell was probably struggling to figure out what the problem was, that his numbers were going down. And, well, that, that was when HP uh, took leadership uh, in the sales of computers in the US. But you know what happened at that stage? Lenovo got really big in China. Positivo got really big in Brazil. Uh, I don't know uh, who was selling computers in India, but uh, the bricks were all, the bricks were, uh, the, bricks were, were, were the places where economy was booming. And could Dell sell computers to those people? No, because they only sold computers to people that were buying their second or third computer, right? It's impossible for you to buy a new computer through the web if you do not have access to the web yet. So this is all to say that there are changes that happen in the environment that affect even a company that is so uh, beautifully built as, as Dell. Dell was conceived to be a company to be flexible, but it was only conceived to be flexible within the limits of its own business proposition. So this is a, 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 an important lesson for us. Uh, even, even companies like Dell that had such, a, such good leadership in terms of uh, trying to see, uh, to, to, to have the ego's view of the world, even those companies uh, end up being tricked by their own trajectory of success by their own su success in the past. But that De was concerned about that. He said, our motto is very good for now, but we have to keep watching because the world is going to change the same way it, as it changed and put IBM out of the, IBM and, well, when I say put out of the market is, is uh, turn the largest players into secondary options in the markets. The same way as that happens uh, for them, uh, he believed that uh, it would also happen to Dell uh, sometime if, uh, if the company was not able to, to, you know, to, 
to think ways of escaping that fate. So uh, understand that structure, culture, uh, winning strategies, they all keep us narrow, in, in thinking in a very na narrow-minded way in the possible future that we have for ourselves uh, and eliminating other possibilities that are the ones that makes, make, make more sense and that will allow that new Dells or new, any, uh, new startups show up, new kids on the block appear and become the, the leaders of the markets. Uh, okay, we've already discussed this issue that uh, Michael Dell, considering that he, he built his business to be modular, to be uh, 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 virtually integrated, he could bring in and take out uh, partners depending on them being successful or not. Right? Uh, and uh, th this is the analogy that we have here with a horse race. In Dell's opinion, would it be possible to create a verticalized company the size of Dell rapidly? Uh, well, basically what he says there in the, in the, in the text is that well, Dell grew that fast simply because Dell used this strategy of looking for partners instead of looking for managers. Right? So they needed something, they would check who in the world already does that. And they would plug that company as part of their business. So, so the business Dell was really big, but the company not necessarily. Right? Uh, there are many companies that, that in the world that uh, try to, to become uh, larger by franchising, for example, their sales. And then uh, they have other people, other entrepreneurs, to put money in into the business and, and, and have the stores, and then they manufacture the product and those stores sell the products. Uh, Dell, to some extent, uh, uh, did some outsourcing of parts of the business and, and, and he invited other companies to become partners in a way that the, the business Dell was, was not only Dell's business. Right? Sony, for example, became uh, a, an important partner here in, in, in some moments because Dell realized that uh, instead of uh, you know, building the, the monitors in the company itself, it, uh, it, it made more sense to buy from a company that was already a leader in the world but again, it was a leader in the, in the world of monitors that after partner, partnering with uh, Dell could uh, increase its own uh, value uh, a lot. Dell was at, at that stage, at this stage here, was selling uh, uh, 3 million uh, computers um, a month, I believe. Uh, the numbers do not matter so much for us, mainly because the numbers of 20 years ago are very different to numbers uh, of today. But anyway, uh, it was a huge business even for a company like uh, Sony. And, and this was one of the companies that Dell brought into that partnership, let's say. Why does Dell prefer to have just a few suppliers than, than a whole lot or the, than lots of suppliers? I remember that when I was uh, your age, possibly exactly your age, uh, I had uh, graduated for, from, from the engineering school uh, and I worked for Siemens in Brazil. And I worked in a, in a, of course, I, I was in the transition from, from a work that I, that I had done while I was uh, studying to work that I would do as an engineer afterwards. And then my, my ex-boss called me and said, look, I, want, I, I know that you want to become an entrepreneur. In fact, I, I had already started a business. Um, we, we want to, we're thinking about outsourcing the department in which you work. And, and I had been working with translations of um, the documents, maybe it was uh, documents for, for telephone exchanges, for telephone, all the electronic equipment that, is, that was required at the operators of telephone uh, services so that people could talk on the phone, right? Uh, so I, I was one of the translators for that and he said, well, you, you seem to be one of the guys who ha has an entrepreneur mindset. If you want to maybe hire a few of the old uh, colleagues of yours, uh, Siemens will be happy to have you as one of our three suppliers of translation services. And I thought it was, uh, at that stage, I thought it was weird that they, they, and, and they, they were sure that they were going to have only three suppliers. Uh, and the reason was a, a little like Dell. They wanted us to be, to feel that the business uh, of Siemens was very important to us. Uh, and uh, they, they wanted us to, you know, if they had a translation, if they needed to have a thousand pages translated from 
English or German to Portuguese over a week, they wish that if they ask us, we would say, yes, we, we will do it, right? It's a lot of work. I can say translate a thousand words, a thousand pages in, in a week. It, it is a lot of work. But at the same time, they, they thought that small companies would be flexible enough to hire people to do that job or, and, and, and to have uh, contact with, uh, with uh, some, even some outsourced translators that they could hire just for the project very quickly and then dismiss and so on and so forth. Something that Siemens could not do it direct, could not do directly. Uh, and uh, at the same time, they knew that uh, if they hired people like me, if we had to work 20 hours a week during that week to make sure that the project was, was done in time, we would do it for one single reason. They paid us a lot of money for that. A lot of money for someone who had been, a, a, you know, who had just started a, a career as, as an entrepreneur, right? Maybe if, if at my age now, if they propose what they proposed back then, I would say, sorry, I'm too tired for that, or I have other priorities or whatever. But at that stage, I had the health and the energy uh, and the enthusiasm to work 20 hours a week, if necessary, to make sure that my customer would uh, get the service in time. And why were they so interested in having that translation made that, that quickly? Because sometimes they spent two years developing those uh, telephone exchanges that costed millions of dollars. And then they had, uh, they, they signed a contract with a, let's say, a Brazilian, at that stage, this was all official, uh, uh, this, this utilities like telephone were done by a government company. So it was a monopoly. And the company that could buy their, their exchanges, their, their technology, would say, okay, we buy that technology from you, but the problem is we will only pay when all the documentation is in Portuguese. So think uh, uh, of a company that is selling a product that is worth millions of dollars, having to wait a month or two to receive payments simply because the documentation is not ready. So they need it ready for yesterday. Uh, and they were happy to pay, I don't know, $50,000 for, for the work, well, not the work of one person, right, at that stage, but the work of maybe uh, 10, 15 people, 20 hours a week for one week or so. Right? So, uh, yeah, but they, they, they need to have only three or, or, or four partnering companies doing that, because otherwise, if they were a lot, they would start, they, uh, uh, the, the price would start becoming an issue. Uh, and and, and if, if people were, were having a competition in price, there would be a time that people would say, you know, I prefer to sleep well than work uh, simply because they're paying me well. Besides, they're not paying me that well any longer. So they said, only three suppliers. This is sort of what Dell does here. They say, we, want to, we, we don't have to have many suppliers. We don't want to squeeze uh, them in the sense that uh, to reduce their price. We want the business to be good for them as well. So that when we need them, they're there for us. Uh, and, and so uh, I think that this is the main reason why they have a few suppliers instead of having a lot of suppliers. Many companies still today think that it's better to have a whole lot of possible potential suppliers so that you can always say, look, if you don't reduce your price here, I will check it with someone else. The problem is that by, when you do that, you optimize your profit locally, you reduce the profits of your supplier, but you also re reduce your supplier's commitment to the business. And when you need the most, they will not be there for you. Okay. All right. Uh, what guarantees does Dell give its suppliers about the continuation of the business with them in the future? Remember, he picks, when I, when I mentioned he here, of course, I'm, I'm talking about the whole company, not only Michael Dell making decisions on his own, but the company picks the best horses in the race. What happens if one of the suppliers, one of those suppliers with whom Dell has important agreements and, and uh, wants to be a, a meaningful, important customer, what if that horse becomes tired? What does Dell do? Dismiss that horse and gets another one, right? So there is commitment here. There is loyalty. Uh, Dell tells its, its uh, suppliers, I will emphasize you, I will give you all the information I can so that you keep being the best, but please keep being the best because I'm not going to carry you around. Right? There is this Brazilian uh, poet, uh, Vinicius de Moraes, who once wrote uh, a beautiful poem about love. 
in which he claimed that love should be forever while it lasted. Love is forever while it lasts. Right? This, this is one of the sayings of the... I don't know if you think that's romantic or not, but that's very practical in the sense that there is good chance that love will last forever uh, when those involved are committed to it. So it's good, it's, it's good that to, to, to think that it's forever, but at the same time, it's good to think that it's only forever if uh, we keep being competitive in that sense. My, my, my wife thinks that's not romantic at all when I tell her, well, we have to keep comp competitive over time, right? We, uh, love is forever. We've, we've been around for, for some 30 years now, uh, but uh, uh, the only uh, uh, certainty we have about the future is that we, 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 we're still committed to building a future together. Uh, and, and when we commit to build a few future together, there is a good chance that we will be together for very long. But notice that Dell does not give anyone a guarantee you are going to be my partner forever. Because if that was the guarantee that he was giving, that guarantee would make the business less competitive in the future because people would say, okay, I can relax now. Again, Siemens, when, when uh, we had that agreement with them, they said, we will only have three suppliers. We will split the, the service that we have among those three suppliers. We will not be bargaining price. We will, be, we will pay pr a good price so that you do not have problems finding people to do those uh, translation works for us in, uh, you know, in the short time that we have. But, uh, but please, uh, never mess up with our, our schedule. If, if, if you promise that you, you're going to deliver it in one week or one month, that has to happen. Uh, never go beyond the level of quality that is acceptable. So they, they had their metrics. But I would say, although it, it was very tiring years, the four or five years that I, that I worked for, for Siemens that way, were enough to, for me to say it. And once they say, well, I can retire. And in fact, I can go and, and, and teach at the university. University don't usually pay us that great. But I said, I can teach for the rest of my life, which is something that I really enjoy doing. And I do not depend on, uh, on, on, on money, at least not the way uh, we usually do. So I, I got my, let's say, at that, that stage, I, I had the feeling that I had gotten my economical independence. Of course, later on in life, you, know, you, you realize that you, you need more than you, you think you do when you're 25 or 26. So I was not as independent as I thought, but, uh, but I, I can assure you that the way Siemens worked with us was sort of in a Dell model saying, yeah, we, 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 will not, we, we want you to, to get very well paid because we know that what we are demanding uh, is, uh, is also a lot from you. And because that has great value for us. The fact is that for, for Siemens, if they didn't have that documentation in time, they would not be able to get paid the $50 million or so. And think of that money, just the, just, just the interest that you would get in the bank. Uh, and you'll see that what they were paying us was for them it was peanuts for us it was a lot of money for them it was peanuts okay uh another question here uh why is dell or why was dell obsessed by the idea of inventory turnover this appears there a lot uh he claims that dell had a turnover turnover is the 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 amount of time between when you buy a product and you're able to sell it, right? They had a, a turnover of, uh, I don't know if, I don't remember exactly what they said on, on the paper, if it's 12 days, 15 days or something like that, nine days. Uh, at that stage, that was the turnover they, that they had. And they said, well, the competition is uh, a lot more, 45 days or so. Okay? Then you, you could even think, well, but how come they, they have 15 days if, if the customer orders the product and the product is only assembled afterwards? That's right, it's only assembled afterwards, but the parts needed to be bought beforehand, right? So we, we, we don't get rid of, fully rid of prediction. We still need to do some prediction. We have to predict uh, what items or, or sort of the amount of items that we will sell. The, the, the difference here is that Dell does not have to predict in the detail. It's almost like they worked uh, as the pizza man. How do pizza men uh, uh, decide the pizzas that they are going to have available for dinner today. They say, well, it's sort of a rainy day. People will be at home. They may ask for, they may, they, they may ask us for a, a, 
you know, for, for pizzas. So today is going to be a day where we will sell a lot of pizzas. But in the middle of the day, uh, the pizza uh, the pizza man still doesn't know what are going to be the flavors of, of the pizza, right? So what what the pizza man uh, does is all the dough, and then uh, he waits for 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 the calls. And when people say, "Well, I want this kind of pizza or that kind of pizza," th that's when he's going to put the the toppings on on the on the pizza, right? So Michael Dell can work a little bit like that. Uh, buy the ingredients in advance but not commit the ingredients to a specific product because he doesn't know exactly what the product is going to be that that was how how uh, it, it, things works um well uh, uh, again uh my idea about this paper is that it deserves being read more than once uh there are more questions here that i i, I had prepared uh, uh to you to reflect on uh i think that this this questions here could be thought of as, let's say, spotlights showing some specific uh, feature that is dealt with in the paper. But I do think that uh, this uh, uh, interview here is a great example of how companies can deal with respect to, to some of those vectors that appeared in one of the Ben Katraman and Henderson's papers. Remember, vector one, uh, the, the, the encounter, the, the virtual encounter with the customer. There's a lot here about selling directly to the customer. Vector two, uh, how are we going to configure our production? There's a lot here. Modularize the product, deal with external uh, partners, the best horses in the, in the, in the field, uh, and, 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 and even the third vector, how are we going to get knowledge from, from our, the customers, the suppliers, and so on, and so on. There's a lot in between lines in this interview that show ways in which Dell learned from the suppliers, from the customers, and helped use and, and that helped uh, the company build products that were better suited to uh, all the customers' needs, right? So uh, after lunch, we will again. Where is my Where is my cursor here? Yeah. After lunch, we will discuss all the changes that uh, and how to deal with the changes that our information technologies can bring to organizations. I told you that. Change may be required, but change is never easy. Uh, changing structures, as the structure of a classroom here, may require more effort than we than we realize. And if we, if we are to plan change involving technology, we better uh, plan for it. We, we better get organized. Otherwise, uh, I mean, there's a lot of projects that fail simply not not because the technology was not good, but simply because the plan for its introduction or the timing of the introduction was not right. So this is what we'll be doing uh, in the afternoon. I think it's this is a good time for us to stop and have some lunch and we'll be back in one hour, right?